What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another reaction to the upcoming stories in Somnophobia. We are going to the, the, eh, the third story today, which is called Cleithrophobia. Uh, I am super excited for this one because I have heard rumours that there is going to be a Ballora in this book, and I don't... Uh, it's got to be this one, right? Because the... Um, it says, and Grady's fear of being trapped in small spaces makes working as a pizzaplex technician ex extremely challenging. It's got to be Ballora, right? Got to be. Um, so, let, yeah, this is by Enton, by the way, uh, like all the others. I want to read the Cleithrophobia intro for you guys tonight. Uh, the other thing I do want to say is, I didn't mention this in the other videos, but this is all in the Fredit Discord. If you want to go see it, it is uh, hashtag uh, FNAF Books Live Reading. Uh, I want to read the Cleithrophobia intro for you guys tonight because it's so surreal with the content it shows. It's not law-breaking, but it's something like a book frights has never done before. You'll get an introduction to the opening days of the Pizzaplex and every single location that exists? No shot. So in Haps, I think it was, they mentioned how it was like a clock. So I'm assuming people have like filled in the entire clock now. And if it's all accurate, then that shows that this is completely canon to the games. That is amazing. You have a place in every location. A map is possible to be made. I'll be reading it in 10 minutes, blah, 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 blah. Some really cool surprises. Wow. Okay. You don't want to miss this. This is insane. Okay. Let's go. I'm super duper excited for this one then. Uh, Kim looked up at the stained glass dome in the centre of the roof of Freddy Fazbear's mega pizzaplex. She grinned and spun in a circle, taking in all the music and laughter. A line of cars on Fast Freddy, another mention of the Fast Freddy. The pizzaplex's roller coaster roared past. Kim gazed eagerly at the coaster's screaming passengers, their hands waving above their heads. She wanted to go on the roller coaster first. Kim frowned and looked around. Why were that? Why were her heads? Sorry. Why were her friends headed away from the coaster's line? She hurried to catch up with them and found them arguing over the Peterplex map. Let me see it, Alicia. Alicia? Yeah, Alicia. Um, Alicia demanded, her curls bouncing as she tried to snatch the map from Cole. Cole easily held the map out of her reach. We agreed that I was the one in charge of the map. Kim rolled her eyes. You know what? They're, you know they give those things away, right? We all could have had one. I told you, Alicia said. Uh, I keep saying Alicia. Alicia? I'm saying... I think Alicia is right. I don't know. I don't really care. <laughs> Hands on her hips. That's a waste of paper. It's not good for the environment. Eric snorted. He threw out his arms to indicate the surroundings of the pizzaplex. And this is... Kim took the map, map from Eric. He didn't protest and instead looked at her in his usual adoring way. Kim had met her friends in kindergarten. And Kim had known that Eric had a crush on her since the first day of playground and all of the seven years since. Seventh graders. Losers. Kim's mom said Eric. Uh, sorry, Kim's mom said Eric thought he wasn't good enough for Kim because Kim was a pretty blonde and Eric wasn't particularly good looking. She thought of Eric as a brother. Uh, Rip my boy. They had the map upside down. They once again described the pizza plex to be shaped like a big pizza. Okay, exactly the same as Haps. So all of these are pr all of these stories happen in the opening days of 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 the pizza plex. They're going to do a tour of the Peterplex before they choose a ride, scouting each attraction. Okay. It wasn't an ordinary map with just places, names, and directions. It was more like a series of cartoon drawings, each depicting a venue in the Peterplex, and each linked to a drawing of one of the Freddy's animatronic characters. Oh, okay. Uh, Eric tapped the map, pointlessly uh, pointing at a cutesy illustration of happy-faced bumper cars. Bumper cars from Haps, yep. Then he nodded over his shoulder at the real bumper cars, which were careening around a small arena. We're here, Eric said unnecessarily. Chica, for example, hovered over a drawing of a giant swing that was to the left of the bumper cars. Chica's old attraction, the Chica swing is real. Uh, to the left of the swing, a bright yellow arrow pointed at a row of smiley-faced stick figures lining up for roller coaster cars. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Kim stopped. She pointed... Behind them at the coaster, we need to go back that way. Alicia took Kim's arm and got her moving again. Come on, Alicia said. I, uh, I know you want to go on the roller coaster, but we'd agreed we'd scope it all out before we choose a ride. This is the first time in the brand new Pizzaplex. Oh no. So this means in the games, there was a Pizzaplex before the Mega Pizzaplex. 
Ah! <laughs> oh no! Her finger traced over a drawing of the costume closet. This was the Urban Legends Roleplay Auditorium! <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! It literally calls out the roleplay section from Somnophobia. That is, I mean, not from Somnophobia, from frickin' Pressure. What is this? This is mad! Continuity is awesome. Just name drops the same location that the one story after is, yeah. This is, this story is amazing so far. What? It hasn't even, like, gotten into any plot. The caption under the picture promised reality fun at its best. Yeah, <laughs> that's a funny callback. Um, there's the entrance to the tubes, Eric said. He pointed at a neon archway. No shot, it's gonna... No shot, that's haps. Um, the arches opened up to a hallway painted with black and white pinwheels. Yeah, this is haps! They looked like they were spinning. On the map, the climbing tubes looked like inter entwined snakes with smiley faces and they were formed into a vague... Uh, a shape vaguely resembling the extent of castle with seemingly endless loops. This is Freddy's fortress. Kim shifted her gaze back to the real fortress entrance. She spotted a poster that featured a cute robot. The caption read, Meet Haps, the friendly mascot of Freddy Fortress. What? What? Okay. Uh, why does it keep doing this? Why does it keep going like up? Anyway, peering at the illustrated map. Um, Kim spotted a tiny rubber treaded robot with big white hands inside one of the tubes. She smiled. She smiled at him. This is Reddit from the Wholesome Plex. I'm gonna cry. After the roleplay venue and the climbing tubes, the map had a drawing of a tilter whirl made to look like Chica's cupcake with multiple arms and legs. Okay. Huh? Sorry. I'm going to shout so loud that I need to go across my room. What? <laughs> what on earth? Hello, Maya. Wait, that wasn't a quote. Oh, okay, wait. So, okay, this is just Entom saying this. Uh, it doesn't say in the book, hello, Maya, but it's... Is it, is it implied that it's Maya? Okay, let me just read, because I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts in a minute. A shout coming from her right caught Kim's attention. A crew of Pizzaplex workers were clustered around the AR booth, which stood between the tilter whirl and the theater in the middle of the Pizzaplex. The, the glass dome was filled with smoke. This is literally showing the true reality of under construction. That is insane. That is so crazy. What? This book series is coming out swinging. What? Okay. Okay. I was like I was captivated before. This has got my attention. We are seeing the events of under construction in the real world. The glass dome was filled with smoke. There was a shout coming from the AR booth. The crew appeared to be trying to pry the booth open. On the map, the AR booth was depicted as a pristine crystal-like globe of fantasy come to life. <laughs> uh, she had a feeling no fantasies would be coming to life in there today. Wow! Like that it moves on. What? I'm so happy right now. Uh, that was such a lovely surprise. That was amazing. <laughs> I'm crying. I'm actually crying. Um, well, my timeline video is going to be easy now. <laughs> my Pizzaplex timeline video, updated version. This, this comes straight after under construction. This is so cool. Oh, I am so happy we got this. Everyone is going to go insane when this book comes out. I'm telling you, I cannot wait to talk about this on our podcast. Um, so, Alicia tried to drag Kim and the boys into the clothing and souvenir shop as they passed it. Al uh, uh, Alicia was a shopaholic. Her mum gave her a massive allowance. When they left the Pizzaplex later that day, Eric and Cole would probably be juggling multiple bags filled with every piece of Fazbear clothing available. Alicia thought the boys were pack mules. <laughs> uh, just past the shops, the aromas of pizza sauce and cheese wafting from the main dining room enticed all four of them. Eric's stomach rumbled audibly and Cole complained that he was going to starve if they didn't eat now. 
you remember when we went to eat, uh, went to the octopus at the county fair after we had burgers? Kim asked a friend. The boys went pale and Alicia laughed. Of course they remembered. Whirling around on a full stomach was never a good idea. They continued on. Wide-eyed, Kim and her friends passed the carousel. On the map, the carousel looked like a giant sombrero. Adorable caricatures of the Freddy's animatronic characters sat along the wide brim of the hat-like image. After the carousel, they passed the arcade. Eric started chattering about all the arcade games. Eric had listed games memorised on their map. Um, next to the arcade on the map, a drawing of two crossed, uh, two crossed laser guns indicated the laser tag arena, yeah, which we also saw in, uh, in Haps. That was where... Um, Aiden and Jace had just come out of because Aiden got a black eye. Um, she won't shut up about Fast Freddy. Okay, we've been around the whole pizza plex. She waved them up. The only thing left is the theatre. She tapped a drawing of a fairy tale like castle. She looked at the map again. Oh, and the little kids' play area underneath it. Can we please go on the roller coaster now? Um, the theatre was mentioned in Ultim uh, Under Construction 2 and Haps. All the locations we've seen are consistent. It's all the same pizza plex. Love that. Love that so much. Love it. Love it. Love it. I've just had one uh, thing that I'm curious about is if we're saying there's a pizza plex before the mega pizza plex, okay, which I'm pretty sure there was anyway, then that would mean it could be the Lally's Game pizza plex, which would mean that every single story we've had so far is canon. Like in like in the same continuity as the games, which is insane if that's true. I am going crazy right now. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> uh, exploring was fine, but she was ready to go on a ride. Wait a second. Eric clung to the map. His nose wrinkled up in concentration as he flipped the map from one side to the other multiple times. There's something listed on the index that isn't on the map. Kim read over his shoulder. Ballora's fitness and flex. Oh, the location is there, but it's on the index. They walked it. Uh, they walled it off. It no longer exists. Oh, no trace of it is there. Confirming the very obvious theory that they've been re uh, renovating and walling off the locations as development went through. Eric turned the map over and ran his finger over the illustrated attractions, showing his friends that Ballora's fitness and flex wasn't depicted. It's not here. See, Alicia looked around. Yeah, and we didn't see it when we circled the whole place either. Maybe it was planned but not included in the final construction. It's weird that they put it in the index, though. Hmm. Kim lost her patience. Whatever. She grabbed the map and stuck it in her jeans pocket. Come on, let's go to the roller coaster. We'll check Ballora's later. This time, no one argued. So Kim led her friends to the end of the line. The map was forgotten as they craned their necks to see the high-tech cars they'd soon be riding. <laughs> Five months earlier. Wait, what? Wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. Wow. That's... Huh? Five months earlier? It's gonna go five months in the past? Okay. Call me, um... Call me, uh, captivate. Call me intrigued. Okay. Well, we don't have to wait for tomorrow because luckily we are doing this like two days after they did the live reading uh, because I was busy on the day and then I had to record all of it, all of the reactions. Anyway, five months earlier, Grady took one last look at the carousel as he checked the attraction off the to-do list on his clipboard. He felt eyes on him and looked up. A shiny painted wood foxy on the carousel seemed to be staring at Grady. Wait, 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 wait. So that prologue... That prologue was just showing when the pizza plex was opened five months prior to this. And uh, I mean, we're saying the pizza plex opened in May. So this would be in January of a month. Uh, this is when this story takes place. And this is why the Ballora location is blocked off because of this incident that we're reading now. This is brilliant writing. It's so well done. Um... Grady glared at the pirate fox and quickly slung his canvas servant toolkit over his shoulder and turned away. He knew it was silly, but he wasn't a big fan of the animatronic characters. He didn't like that they all had big teeth and they had a way of looking like they were planning something, something that wouldn't be too good for uh, humans. Artificial intelligence had never seemed like a good idea to him. It wasn't good for robots to have too much control. Giving Foxy one last, I'm human and you're not, so there, glare. 
uh, Grady strode out onto the black and white tiled floor of the Pizza Plex's main walkway. The whole domed facility kind of got to Grady, although the Pizza Plex would soon be a place of fun and frivolity, at least in according to the advertisements, right now it was just a vast warehouse crammed full of dormant games and rides. He had no problem imagining ghosts behind the attractions. Oh, oh, that's that's chilling. Uh, he applied for Fazbear Entertainment after seeing an ad for a technician and expected to be in a comfortable office at a computer terminal, but instead he was assigned as a troubleshooter for the Pizzaplex, Amazon type beat. <laughs> uh, it was a hands-on pr uh, position that required working with the Freddy's games, rides and entertainment venues. That meant that Grady had to be there in the big silent Pizzaplex all uh, day after day. He was part of the team preparing for its grand opening and once the Pizzaplex opened, Grady would be one of the maintenance techs. Someone tapped Grady on the shoulder. He yelped and whirled around. Youch! <laughs> MF yelped. Now we are about to be introduced to FNAF's best character in forever. Really? Okay. Uh, whoa, sorry Grady, I didn't mean to scare you. Grady relaxed when he saw one of his fellow technicians, Ronan. Ronan, this guy, has the body of the goddamned Giga, Giga Chad. <laughs> Giga Chad. Uh, but he's a tech nerd. You didn't scare me, Grady said. He was just surprised, just like when he found out Ronan's favourite pastime was knitting. Aww. Um, the Peterplex gave Grady the willies. The Peterplex gave Grady the willies. He wasn't actually scared of anything he'd seen so far. No matter what his imagination conjured, he knew there weren't really any ghosts around here. Besides, the truth was that the only one thing really scared... Uh, that only one thing really scared Grady. And that one thing that actually... And the one thing that actually terrified him. Tate... Wait, Tate? <laughs> Tate asked me to find you. We only have 50, uh, 10 minutes left on our shift, though. I don't know why I'm making up words. It does not say 15. Uh, yeah, that's what I told Tate, but he said that wasn't enough time to run a full test on anything. He said we should go just come back in the morning and do the rest of the safety checks. You know, I hate to agree with Tate about anything, but he kind of has a point. Grady frowned. But tomorrow's Saturday. My friends and I plan to hold... Uh, day of gaming. I've already bought the pretzels and the chips and the <laughs> dip. He would have invited Ronan, but Ronan doesn't like violent things. Ronan's face crumpled, making him look like a scolded puppy. Sorry, he said, I'm working on a sweater for my cousin. No problem, Grady said. Heavy footsteps started toward Grady and Ronan. They both looked toward the laser tag arena, which was tucked into a pool of darkness a hundred feet away. Tate jogged into view with his long blonde hair flying around his head. The silly goofball. <laughs> What are we waiting for? My girlfriend got two steaks and is waiting for me at the lake. We're going to fire up the barbecue. Come on, let's lock it up and get out of here. Grady was always sporting Hawaiian shirts and knee-length shorts even in the winter. He belonged on some tropical island, not in landlocked state a thousand miles from the nearest beach. The closest to the shore uh, that Utah is, depending on the beach, on what beach is, is 700 to a thousand miles from there to California or Mexico. It's just a neat detail. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's definitely in Utah. It has, the Pizzaplex has to be in Utah because of the FNAF 6 um, law documents or, you know, you know, it says Utah. It doesn't say Hurricane, it says Utah. Um, but yeah, it's at least in Utah. However, if Grady was being honest, his real reason for disliking Tate was the uh, that the guy reminded Grady of someone from his past, someone he preferred to regret, uh, forget, sorry. Uh, okay, so it's not like a Jessica backstory where we don't know anything, but... Uh, I don't want to come back in the morning, Grady told Tate. Grady looked down at his clipboard. He only had, uh, three attractions left to check. He has a little hand unit styled toolkit. It's not said to be hand unit, but it's a toolkit he plugs into machines. I don't want to spend my Saturday working. We could finish them all in a couple of hours. Tate made a face. Well, I wouldn't. I'm ready to hit it. Come on. He punched Grady's shoulder and started to stride away. Tate tried to walk around and turned around when he realised nobody was following him, so he's like, really? We're not supposed to split up, Ronan said, and no one is ever supposed to be here alone. That's the protocol. It's starred and highlighted in the employee's manual. Tate quirked an eyebrow at Ronan. You read that thing, didn't you? Ronan asked. Tate flipped his fingers dismissively. I skimmed it. FNAF fans. Uh, that means he looked at the cover, Grady said. Ha ha ha, Tate mocked. But I do know about the protocol. It's on that poster in the locker room too. Posters. So he can read, Grady said. That's it. I'm out of here. He looked at Ronan. And since you're my ride, you have to come too. Go ahead, Ronan, Grady said. 
I know you have your hitting, uh, your knitting club get-togethers on Friday evenings. I'll stay and finish my rounds. Uh, it's interesting how that is in bold. There's so many gifts, Enton, gifs, whatever you want to say. Ronan frowned. You're sure? I couldn't stay, so you aren't alone. Grady smiled. You're a good guy, Ronan, but no, seriously, go. I'll be fine. Grady had to shoo him away before he disappeared around the far side of the castle-like theatre, rising up from the middle of the pizzaplex. Consistency. Oh, yeah, okay. We're getting information on the internals of the pizzaplex. Stretching for 50 feet or so uh, over the top of the top of the employee area and administration offices, a massive two-may mirrored expanse looked out over the entire complex. A security station was behind the glass, but it wasn't functional yet. The cameras were all turned off. Fazbear Entertainment was having trouble with the internal computer network. You remember those emails, right? Employee records are being kept in physical files because the system had dumped the data. What is this? Uh Oh yes, this is from FNAF AR. Oh, I see. So this was just they were having trouble with the internal systems. This data package has been identified as a potential virus. Huh. Okay, well, uh, there's Vanessa. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. Employee records are being kept in physical files. Like, right here. Physical file, because the system had dumped the data. Oh, that's, yeah, okay. I see, I see. So this is what actually happens in the... That's a very good detail. That's a very good detail. Um, It was kind of the Dark Ages, but apparently the programmers are working on it. No, this email wasn't in the book. I posted it because it's probably a reference to this and the unused emails are being repurposed into the stories. Yes. Yes, I love that. I love it so much. Uh, a door slammed in the distance. Then the pizza plex was silent. It begins. The only lights on were the security lights. The ca they cast anemic glows along the walkways and over the various attractions. Night mode moment. As long as he had a way or out of wherever he was, Grady was fine. But if he got locked inside, Grady shivered. Grady shivered and quickly checked his pockets for the master keys he and every other technician carried. He exhaled when he felt their jagged metal edges and heard their comforting jangle. Okay, he was okay. Grady lifted his clipboard and looked at his list. Grady had two games left to check in the arcade, ski ball and hoops. <laughs> TM. Uh, after that, he just needed to test Ballora's finish and flex. It shouldn't take too long. The arched entrance to the arcade was only 30 feet or so from the carousel. Grady hurried down the main aisle of the arcade and reached for the long row of skee-ball machines. They were painted in bright colours and were all watched over by painted wooden cutouts of Freddy's characters. For the next several minutes, Grady creatively cursed Tate for his ineptitude as he fixed the arcades. Grady had to check all the sensors and scoring switches before he found the problem in the ball controller. Tate was an idiot. He fixed the skee-ball... Now time to move on to Chica Shot ho ho Hoops. Uh, taking his kit to the Chica Shot Hoops game, Grady performed a diagnostic on it, then turned it on so he could test it. Grady played around and managed a score of 30. He'd only made 15 baskets. Grady's grandmother would be embarrassed for him. She was a whiz at this game. He and his gran often went to a small arcade not from his neighbourhood. His gran was like a pro basketball player. Granny Ballin. <laughs> Putting up shot after shot so fast, she regularly scored between 160 and 200. She was a phenom. She would be disappointed. It was time to move on to the last venue he had to check before he could go home and enjoy his weekend. But Laura soon, okay. Ronan and Tate could come in on Saturday and work. Meanwhile, Grady would be home munching on pretzels and playing his favourite game with his online friends. There he paused and checked off ski ball and hoops from his list. He looked at his last task and sighed. All right, Ballora, here I come. The entrance to Ballora's fitness and flex was a relatively, by Fazbear Entertainment standards anyway, nondescript doorway tucked between the laser tag arena and the lineup area for the roller coaster. It's not maze size. Right? Because the... I'm, I'm assuming maze size was next to the laser tag arena? In the game, I can't quite remember. Uh, the arched doorway, unlike most of the brightly coloured, light-wrapped entryways in the pizzaplex, was made of natural polished wood and had a carved sign above it. Something malicious is brewing. 
Beyond the doorway, a red painted hallway sloped downward and led to the long flight of stairs with alternating black and white steps. Ballora's was one of only two venues that, was, that went beneath the pizza plexus main level. The other venue was only partly underground, a portion of Freddy's Fortress. The uh, network of climbing and sliding pipes that snaked throughout the entertainment center was also below ground. Grady knew this from the planning memos he and the other techs were required to read. Thankfully, he'd never have to check out the pipes at Freddy's Fortress. Yeah, because haps. Uh, oh, here we go, here we go. According to the specs he'd read, a maintenance robot haps was designed to keep the pipe safe. Ah, so that makes sense that he doesn't need to go in there because there's already a robot that's keeping the place safe. He didn't want to leave his safety in the hands of newly built robotics. Grady paused at the base of the stairs. He frowned. Wasn't that what he was going to be doing in Ballora's Fitness and Flex? A shiver skittered down his spine. He reached the bottom. The place is dark, so he searches for the breaker lights. He flipped the panel on. Shining red neon and yellow LED lights blinked on. Um, white spots lights flooded the space with a near uh, near nearly blinding glow. Grady took a deep breath and surveyed the venue he'd most dreaded working on. He tried to ignore the fact he was shaking. Um, Ballora's Fitness and Flex was an exercise venue different from anything Grady had seen before. Like a climbing wall, it was a vertical attraction. The starting platform was 50 feet up in the air, reached by a long ladder. An intricate series of serpentine or serpentine sorry, tubes led from the platform to the door. The tunnels were made of clear plastic and they tapered from a couple feet wide at the top of, to what appeared to be barely wide enough for a teenager to squeeze through at the bottom. All of them were visible behind the transparent wall that enclosed them. Grady shivered. It looked like an ant farm. <laughs> um, the oh god, where where are we? The idea behind the venue, Grady knew, was to force participants to wriggle and pull themselves through tight spaces, requiring them to twist and turn and stretch themselves around the curves of the tunnels to get to the bottom. All this physical activity was designed to provide aerobic strengthening and flexibility conditioning, and theoretically a lot of fun. Grady was more skeptical, uh, more than skeptical about fun. He's now thinking back to when he, Tate, and Ronan were discussing the construction of the attraction and what they talked about. When Ronan, Tate, and Grady had looked at the list of attractions that needed to be tested, Grady had taken a hard pass on Ballora's. My idea of exercise is walking from my gaming chair to my fridge. Tate uh, fat-shamed Grady. I don't think Mr. Universe here can make it through the narrow tunnels. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, unfortunately, it's designed more for kids and ordinary-sized adults. Ronan nodded. Uh, it's not a Steven Universe reference. Uh... Wow. Okay. It had taken every ounce of will Grady had to not launch himself across the table they'd sat at and wrapped his hands around Tate's throat. When Grady had faced off with the Tate look alike from his past, he'd been too young to do anything but cry. Now he was bigger and he could have throttled Tate if he didn't mind going to jail. Grady shook his head, bringing himself back to the present in Ballora's fitness and flex. His legs suddenly felt shaky. It was interesting really how chi uh, childhood patterns carried on into adulthood. His reactions to uh, his reactions to were nearly all dictated by experiences he had when he was little, the food for example, and his biggest fear. It was just six hours of his life. Six hours and thirteen minutes, that was all. Grady did the math in his head. Of the roughly fifteen million minutes he'd been alive, the three hundred and seventy three minutes of his ordeal was just an in infinitesimal percentage of the totality of his experience. God, that's such a hard line to say. But the impact of it, that was another story. When he was little, his parents loved to dance. They didn't dance much now. His dad had slipped discs, and his mum had never fully recovered from a broken ankle. But 23 years ago, at least three or four times a week, Grady's parents had gone to a dance studio to practice for amateur dance contests. This meant Grady was left with a lot of babysitters. They weren't bad parents or anything. When she wasn't dancing, his mum stayed home and took care of him. They weren't neglectful, they uh, they just weren't that discerning when it came to choosing babysitters. At least not that one night. His recent babysitter wasn't available, so they had to use a babysitter they'd never used before. She had been recommended by a friend, but it turns out the friend wasn't a very attentive mother and didn't really care who uh, who was taking care of her kid. The babysitter was a teenager named Francis, and she brought a boy over named Boone without telling Grade's parents. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh at names, but Boone is quite a funny name. Uh, this is Boone, Francis has told Grady. Boone had looked down at Grady. You like hide-and-seek, kid? 
Yeah, I played with Lally's game. Uh, Grady, working to get peanut butter off the roof of his mouth, nodded eagerly. Grady didn't know much at five years old, but he did know it wasn't nice to wander around someone else's house. Boone disappeared and walked around, opening doors and closets. Boone returned, and when he did, he yelled out a hand to Grady and smiled. He led Grady to a linen closet. When they got to the closet, Boone opened the closet door before, oh, before Grady could react. Boone shoved Grady under the bottom shelf in the closet. You hide there, Boone had said. You hide there, ooga booga. There was barely any room for Grady to squeeze, uh, to squeeze. He tried to get the words out to ask if he was going to count down, but he didn't understand uh, how Grady could win the game if Boone already knew where he was hiding. He didn't get the words out, though. Boone didn't give him a chance. Boone shut the door, leaving Grady in a tiny dark space. Foreshadowing. Um, their, far their laughter went uh, further away, and Grady cried out. He tried to reach for the knob, but he couldn't. That's when Grady started screaming, and that's when the 373 minutes started. He had learned to tell time just a week ago when his parents had given him a small watch. The watch had hands, not just numbers, but they could glow in the dark at night. Thanks to those hands, Grady could see the minutes going by even in the near darkness of the closet. The linen closet smelled like his mother. It wasn't a bad smell, but it made Grady's nose itch, and it reminded him of his mother, who wasn't there to help him. Somehow smelling her, but not uh, knowing she wasn't here made everything worse. He screamed and screamed and screamed. Why wouldn't Boone and Francis let him out? No matter how much he shrieked, they didn't come. Grady screamed for 62 of those 373 minutes. Because his peanut butter sandwich made him thirsty, it cleared up his throat. Uh, closed up his throat, sorry. He couldn't scream anymore, so he had to focus on his breathing, and his nose was stuffed from crying. During this time, he thought he was going to die. This is where his fear stemmed from. I see. Another mention of, like, fears. Um... I, that something I didn't point out in Somnophobia is, is they did talk about their fears and stuff, uh, various fears of things, and um, in this one they're talking about uh, where, a uh, where a fear stemmed from. They're both named after phobias, you know, Somnophobia, Clethrophobia, so that is why we're getting so many fear stories, because a lot of the events of the, uh, a lot of the occurrences in, in the Pizzaplex are because of past fears. Um, uh, or fears that originate from past things, you know. Um, what, 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 uh, where was I? Uh, I don't know where I was. Grady's mum and dad had come home an hour early than they promised to. They found Francis and Boone on the couch sleeping when Boone had finally admitted where he'd uh, stashed Grady. The boy had barely been conscious. Grady hadn't spoken for days after that. At that time... Grady never found out exactly what happened to Francis and Boone. He just knew that his parents said they were pressing charges. Wow. At the time, Grady wasn't sure what it meant, but he hoped it hurt Francis and Boone a lot. Because of this emotional damage, he was unrested and his parents didn't know what to do. In their guilt, they gave him a special treatment. They brought candies and chips that he'd never had before. Eventually, he associated with this comfort. Um, something I've realised about each of these stories is they're all about overcoming fears and breaking out from that shell. Yes, exactly. Their fears being things that prevent from, from their full potential. I mentioned this not only because it's cool, but I'd keep it in mind for a plot element in epilogue. Oh! Oh! Could it be to do, like, I remember in the third... Was it in the third epilogue? Yeah, in the third epilogue, we were introduced to Agony, right? In Citrace. Um, so maybe we're, int we're getting introduced to like how fear comes into this and phobias and how maybe um, like irony, I guess, kind of like a lot of people who have fears of things keep seeing them because they have fears of them. I don't know. Something like that. I don't know. That was a really bad uh, prediction. Anyway, despite Grady being deathly afraid he was going to do it, this is why Grady is my favorite protagonist in the series. Wow. Wow. That's that's a OK, good. Good to hear. Um, he wasn't going to be responsible even partly for anyone going through a trauma like he did when he was stuck in the closet. Yes. Yeah. Um, he's climbing up the ladders. The workout montage montage ensues. Dun, 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 dun. Rising up. Back to the street. Uh, oh, yeah. Are you a man or a mouse? He told himself as he worked his way up. He did. It got into the tube. He's doing it. He did it, but Tate couldn't. He began twisting into one of the last tubes until a clicking sound and a whoosh startled him into immo immobility. He turned his head. But Laura, the animatronic mascot of the fitness venue, pupped 
up out of a hole in the platform, her long eyelashes fluttered as she turned her metal head and aimed her purple eyes at Grady. Now, I know Dance With Me is like a very unpopular story. It's very controversial because it's uh, not what people wanted, I guess. Uh, I personally liked Dance With Me, but I can admit that this already is presenting Ballora in a much more threatening manner than Dance With Me. And I'm so glad that we're getting uh, like a better Ballora story. Because Ballora is a scary character, honestly. Like, she is one of the scariest fun times, I think. Uh, if not the scariest. So, it's good that we're getting Ballora content. Hello, hello, welcome here, Ballora sang in a sweet voice. It's time to play, nothing's to fear. <laughs> nothing's to fear. Uh, Ballora's little ditty was in a minor key and dropped down at the end of each phrase. It in no way reassured him. He found it kind of haunting. Grady had only seen sketches of Ballora before now. She was much more impressive in person. Ballora was an animatronic designed to look like a ballerina. In the sketches Grady had seen, Ballora wore a blue leotard and tutu. But this version of Ballora was just her upper body, which was attached to a robotic mechanism that moved her through the exercise venue. She was pretty in a weirdly robotic way. This is terrifying. It was just her upper body attached to a robotic mechanism. Oh my gosh. She had blue hair caught up in a bun and held with what looked like a fan-shaped flamenco dancer style comb. Ballora's exoskeleton, or sorry, endoskeleton, was made of a combination of metal and thick rubber encased wires arranged to resemble musculature. Uh, her limbs were articulated so she could move with the grace of a dancer. In most of the sketches, Ballora stood with her arms lifted gracefully over her head, but now they were thrown out to the sides as if making a grand welcoming gesture. I encourage you to slide on in, Ballora said aiming her arm at the tube. Grady really didn't like B Ballora's tune. He tells her to stop singing. Stop singing, Grady said. I don't like the singing. Ballora spun again her servo's word, and when she stopped, Grady heard a metallic clink. He wondered if that was normal. He'd make a note of that too. Please try a tube. I can help you get to the bottom. Uh, yeah, Grady asked doubtfully. What can you do to help? I'm here to make sure you don't get stuck. Grady's heart pounded. It was taking everything he had not to scramble back to the ladder and flee from the fitness centre. Maybe he should just quit his job. Yeah, and pay the rent with what? It had taken him months to find this job, and it was a good one. Besides, if he didn't test the tubes, who would? Please give it a try, Ballora said in a soothing voice. You can do it. Grady looked at Ballora. You promised to get me out if I'm stuck? I'll help you out if you get stuck, Ballora assured him. Should he believe her? Absolutely not. But he had no choice. He had to do his job right. No matter what Grady thought of the animatronics, this one had to be tested. The only way to test her was to crawl into the tube. Ballora smiled. Ballora spun again and again, her spin ended in a sharp clinking sound. Grady used the clink as some sort of starter gun. He crawled headfirst into, uh, into the closest tube. Crawling montage again, it's an actual workout for him to the point where he is sweating profusely, able to easily slip around tight corners better because he's able to slide easier with the sweat. Oh my gosh. He once again pushes his fear aside and focuses on thinking about his job and the kids that would test it. That was one more thing he should notate in his report. What steps would be taken to make sure the tubes didn't reek like a boy's gym locker room? Surely Grady wouldn't want to be the only one to sweat in these tight spaces. Maybe instruction pam pamphlets should be passed out before anyone goes into the tube. He imagined that instructions were given to climbers before they tried to scale the wall. The same should be true for these tunnels. Not everyone was a natural born spelunker. Get on with it, he told himself. Grady was met at a small turn that led sorry, to what uh, into what was marked as checkpoint number one, a platform with enough headspace for Grady to sit upright. Phew, or woo, Grady said out loud. He was sweating profusely. He ached in places he didn't know he had. Uh, Grady tried not to think about how the platform size resembled the floor of the linen closet. Oh. Wait a second. I think I've caught on to what the fear thing is now. Insomnophobia? Uh, it seems like fears definitely um, were a big factor in the crossover between reality and fake reality or in other words like memories right and I feel like that's kind of what's happening here his fear is kind of crossing the reality is making him cross the reality uh from like actual reality and uh his his past 
his past trauma with the closet. I don't know if that is a good hypothesis, but it's it's the only one I've got right now. And I think that is, I, I honestly think that's a good prediction, kind of like how, how fears work. Uh, it kind of like blurs the line between reality and memories, I guess. He saw a small sign that said, you are only one third of the way to the bottom, congratulations. One third? We're more than halfway through the story, just let the impatient people out there know. Okay, good. Uh, I am getting tired of um, of reading, but um, I mean reading out loud. Like, this is really good writing. I, I just want to pick up the pace a little bit, because these videos take a while to make. <laughs> um, Grady dropped his, hands to his head into his hands. He thought this was the halfway point. He looked down and shook his head. Idiot, he admonished himself. Grady licked his lips. He was really thirsty and he wished he'd had some water. That was one thing. Oh, that was another thing, sorry. People were going to be thirsty. He had to mark it down. Maybe add water fountains at each che checkpoint. Always doing the best for others. Grady, however, thought this was a major design flaw. If only they had someone like him plan the venue. Then again, if he had planned it, it wouldn't exist. He wouldn't have come up with something so diabolical in a million years. When he peered into the section of the tubing, his breath caught in his throat. The tube he had looked into was narrower than the one he'd just crawled through. He'd investigated a few more tubes opening off the platform. All were smaller than what he'd already been through. Great, just great. He goes head first into the tube. We then have lots of filler on of him climbing once again. Until he gets stuck. Grady thrashed for several minutes, getting more and more freaked out. Finally, he screamed help. He had no idea why he was screaming. He was alone in the pizza plex. Not a soul could hear him. But what about Ballora? Ballora, he called out. Help, I want out. I... I'll give you five minutes to, to calm down. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Ballora, he called out. Help, I want out. He called again. Nobody heard him. He was just about to berate himself for the stupidity of trusting a robot when he heard a rumble coming along the tube, to, uh, coming along the tube below him. A clank sounded just a few feet from him, and then Ballora's torso snapped into view a couple feet below Grady's head. He twisted his neck to look at her. Ballora... Uh, blinked her purple eyes at him and fluttered her lashes. That is so creepy. Uh, she spun in a circle and smiled wide enough for him to see all her teeth. Grady shivered. Don't give up now, Ballora encouraged. You can do it. Twisting through tunnels is good for flexibility. I'm stuck. How can I twist through the tunnels if I'm stuck? Ballora did another spin and started to sing. I'd be happy to help you. I'm here to get you through. What did I say about the singing? Stop singing. Um, Ballora held out her hands. Here, let me help you. Ballora was programmed to help make it through the fitness tubes. Grady had seen her specs. She'd get him out of the predicament. He reached out for Ballora to take his hand. As soon as Ballora's metal fingers closed over Grady's softer ones, she clamped down. He, her grip pinched his knuckles. Ow! Ballora ignored him. She started skimming downward through the tube, her systems thrumming deeply. The sound vibrated the tube's plastic walls. Ballora didn't go out fast. Uh, sorry, Ballora didn't go too fast, but even so, when she tugged, Grady feared his arms were going to come out of their sockets. Uh, sharp pain surged through his shoulders as she yanked him forward. That hurts, Grady exclaimed. Ballora still ignored him. She kept moving down, smoothly and gracefully, through the tube. With just one snatch, Ballora had Grady free of the turn that had seized him. However, that was only one of many that may... Wait, that was... What, only one of many that may between where Grady got stuck and the next checkpoint. Almost there, she sung. And after a few bumps and turns, she caught him to the checkpoint. He found himself at another checkpoint. Ballora let go. Ballora let go immediately and hugged herself. Grady sobbed in relief and in torment. Just because Ballora had stopped pulling on him didn't mean Grady felt better. His shoulders were screaming bloody murder. It hurts. He snivelled like a little kid. Ballora ignored him. She stared and then suddenly she descended back into the tubes, disappearing. Bye, Ballora. <laughs> he's now thinking about who the fuck came up with the programming for Ballora and he knows how uh, and he knows she's unsafe because she had enough strength to possibly kill him his arms are already sore and he's bruised a lot but not majorly injured clearly the, Ballo uh, clearly the designer was a complete fool he was going to make sure whoever designed Ballora wouldn't get a job in the industry again <laughs> um, he's still pushing on to the next tubes despite almost breaking a limb from the sharp turns Chad Tube cool montage. Everything hurts, but she's uh, but he's still trying to go so he can get out. Suddenly, after crawling through the tubes again, he hears something. It's Ballora again. But something's wrong. She's glitching. Her senses are off. She's acting wrong. She isn't programmed to act like this. She's malfunctioning. I like that that um that emoji. 
But Laura Gallery call back. Each time he hears her near, he stands still and holds his breath. Yes, okay. But Laura Gallery. Very cool. That's cool. I love that callback. That's great. I do not sense movement down there. Do you need assistance? She was programmed to react to verbal responses, but she would now appear and render aid when no one spoke. Something was wrong. He keeps crawling. She calls out once in a while as she progresses through the tubes. My senses are indicating progress has stopped. Do you need help? She's doing the shit the, the Glamrocks do when they ask for them to come out. Please, can you come out? I just want to help. I'm required to provide help to anyone who gets stuck. No one can get stuck in Ballora's fitness and flex. Fitness is fun. I am here to ensure you complete the flex course. Uh, his ass is not listening. Smart. I have to go to dinner. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, crawling more into the tube. Ballora heads right into his direction. When he heard the sound, Grady tried to put his arms in. Unfortunately, they had no place to go. Grady's arms were outstretched and his shoulders were wedged between the two wolves. His arms were dangling below him. They were ripe for robotic picking. <laughs> oh, wow, I like that line. Uh, Grady closed his fingers into fists. Maybe that would m make his hands less appealing to an unhelpful, helpful robot. Grady remained perfectly still and he closed his breath against... Uh, again. Uh, he closed his eyes. A metal clank announced that Ballora had popped up beneath him. Ballora's hands gripped. Grady's clenched ones. Go away, he shouted. I don't want your help. Get out of here. Ballora bit blinked at him, but she didn't let go of his hands. I'm here to help, she insisted in a sinister tone. You guys ever wanted to hear a new Ballora song? The first knife thrust of pain came quickly. Oh, wow! It speared through his shoulder sockets and thrust its way down to his shoulder blades. Oh, my God! What? This, this went from zero to ten really quickly. Um, Grady called out. It's just a little way to the end, Ballora sang. I'll get you around every bend. <laughs> Spitting bars. Uh, as Ballora went down another turn, Grady's wrists cracked. He heard them snapping like pretzels. Uh, as soon as they did, he could tell they were flopping at the ends of his arms. It's paralleling to when his wrists broke in the linen closet. Yes, it is. You're right about that, Entom. <laughs> You're so right. Uh, Ballora noticed as well. Uh, she shifted her grips uh, to above his elbows. His upper arms broke. He yelled. Grady realised uh, through the black miasma of pain that he wasn't going to pass out. Most of his blood pooled in his head. His brain was as was well supplied with what it needed to keep tugging along and his brain didn't care that the rest of him was enduring more pain than the human body was designed to handle. It didn't care that Ballora's determined Shrek through the tube was deconstructing Grady's skeletal structure joint by joint, bone by bone. Didn't care that Grady was being twisted and compressed into something unlike the pretzels he so loved. <laughs> oh, I had to stand up for that. That's so good. That's so good. I don't want to be twisted and compressed into a meat pretzel. Oh, I love that reference. If you didn't know, that is one of Gregory's lines, basically, in Security Breach. Su such a funny callback, honestly. All Grady could do was scream and cry as he felt his body break apart. It's not over. We have ten pages left and he switches perspective to Ronan and Tate going back to the pizza plex because Ronan forgot his keys to his house. Wow. Okay. I love this switch. It feels reminiscent of uh, what we found where freaking Hudson. Uh, was it Hudson in that story? Or was that uh, jump for tickets? I always. Oh, no, that was Colton. Uh, Hudson. I might get. I might be getting them mixed up. No, it's Hudson. Hudson in... Uh, Fazbear's Fright uh, dies in the oven or whatever and the last scene that we see is his friends coming back um, to, uh, to Fazbear's Fright the next day and smelling something burning but everything was completely normal so the ending is not what you expect oh I'm so excited I'm so excited it is in my opinion one of the most unique ones in the series let's watch okay Tate is being a bastard because he's complaining at how Ronan wishes to follow the rules and park in his own parking spot, despite it being a few yards away from the employee's entrance. I don't like to break the rules, Ronan said. Nobody's even here. You can just park right by the entrance. There's a no parking zone, Ronan said back. You're a weird dude, Tate told Ronan as they walked to the employee's entrance. Tate couldn't seem to get over the fact that Ronan was both a bodybuilder and a knitter, that he was in a local fight club and he owned a minivan named Betty so he could drive his knitting club members to textile conventions and knit-alongs. Okay, 
Ronan is a bodybuilder in a fight club and knits as pastime. This is the greatest character. <laughs> okay, I disagree, but yeah. Uh, Ronan had no trouble with checking in on Grady. He's been reluctant to leave Grady alone in the first place. He didn't like breaking the rules. Even if I did ha didn't have bad knees, I still wouldn't have gone to Ballora's. Those tunnels are too small, and I don't even have claustrophobia or anything. Not like Grady. He doesn't have claustrophobia, Ronan said. He has cleithrophobia. People with claustrophobia don't like small spaces, whether they're trapped or not. People with cleithrophobia can tolerate small spaces as long as they know they can come and go. They're afraid of being stuck. Exactly. That's the, that's the big difference. I'm, I like how they clarified that. I think everybody had to look up what cleithrophobia was when, when it was announced, because, like, what? we never heard of cleithrophobia. We've heard of claustrophobia. We've never heard of cleithrophobia. So now I know the difference. So that's a cool... Cool. Uh, FNAF is making me learn. Uh, Ronan knows because he's friends with Grady. He's a good friend. They pass the giant swings, but Ronan doesn't look at it because the night mode security lights cast a shadow that makes them look like a giant squid. Oh my god, that's terrifying. Um, Ronan is uh, scared of squids. They're going to Ballora's. I'm terrified of squids as well, honestly. Uh, <laughs> if anybody, uh, if anyone gets me, uh, Club Penguin, the the big giant squid. Anyway. Uh, they get to the bottom of the <laughs> they get to the bottom of the stairs, and Ronan accidentally bumps into Tate because he stopped at the bottom. He was looking up. Ronan followed his gaze to see what he was looking at. As he wi eh, he wished he hadn't. He's alive. Oh, Ronan almost faints, and Tate, for the first time in his life, is comforting, scarily comforting. Tuck your head in, big guy. Breathe in. Paralyzed. He's sitting in the tubes, paralyzed but alive, looking out and watching his co-workers. One of his eyes are missing. Oh man, he said. I think I just saw him blink. The runner groaned. He couldn't even imagine. He didn't want to imagine what Grady was feeling. In the too long glimpse he had gotten of Grady, Ronan had seen that not only were Grady's limbs contorted into impossible positions, like Stranger Things, but his his uniform was saturated with blood. Many of his bone breaks must have been compound fractu fractures. Sorry, Ronan could only guess, not that he wanted to, at how many times Grady's shattered bones had jabbed through his skin. Yeah, Tate said. He just did it again. He's alive. Tate sounded calm, but his voice was tight. Ronan found it absurdly uh, comforting that Tate was affected by what he was looking at. Maybe the guy wasn't as shallow as Ronan had thought. We need to get him out of there, Ronan said. How are we going to do that? We have no way to get into those tubes. We need to call 911, Ronan said. Uh, before he could reach his phone out from his pocket, Tate plucked it from his hand. Dude, what were you thinking? I'm thinking we need to get him out of there. And if we can't do it, we need to get someone here who can. Tate shook his head. We can't do that. Ronan raised both eyebrows. What in the world do you mean? Tate looked at him pit pitifully. You don't get it. If we call someone, it's going to come out that we left him here alone. And this is what happened. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Obviously, this venue was totally screwed up if this happened. Tate went on. If Grady survives, he would have no problem making a workers' comp claim. Heck, he, or most likely his family, because I don't see how he could survive that, Tate waved his hand at the tubes, might even be able to sue Fazbear Entertainment. Well, no, they are not. If an injury is intentional, an employee or surviving family can sue, and his and intentional is defined as having um, certain knowledge an injury would occur and willfully disregarding that knowledge. But Fazbear Entertainment could have known for sure someone would get injured there. Are you kidding me? Tate said. Do you see uh, the size of those lure tubes? No way a full-sized man can make it through those, and yet they wanted one of us to test it. They knew we would get hurt. Tate explains to Ronan that if Fazbear Entertainment found out their lives would be at stake, they would not only lose their job, but their livelihood. Ronan would lose his home from lack of mor mortgage payment. Uh, he would never get a another job in the tech industry. They would ruin him. Or ruin them, sorry. Uh, they want to help, but they can't. By all means, they could help Grady, but they would put so much at stake, the fear is controlling them. Wow. That's, that is kind of heartbreaking, honestly. Like, what do you do in that situation? Okay, fine, but that means they deserve to be sued. Why can't we get him out? Grady's injuries are a liability nightmare. What do you think Fazbear Entertainment is going to do with the two employees that left Grady here by himself? We left him here. The dilemma is, save Grady and deal with the cost of Fazbear Entertainment doing whatever to them, um, having the livelihood taken, no job, their family being broke, or leave him to die. Yeah, this is a great, great um, section, I think. But was his new house more important than another human's life? Obviously not. Even Tate is starting to tear up. But we have to help him. He's... His voice broke. He couldn't find the words to describe it. Yeah, I know, Tate said. I know. He too cleared his throat. But look at him. The minute anyone tries to move him, he's going to be in excruciating pain. He will bleed out in a worse condition. 
Ronan has a terrible thought, but if he's blinking, that means he's conscious and he couldn't say it. And yeah, he's probably in horrible pain, I get it, but then again, maybe not. Look at how his spine is all screwed up, maybe he's paralysed, there's no way to tell. Uh, Ronan didn't look at Grady's spine, he latched onto the hope that Grady didn't feel the agony racking his body. You can only imagine what was what what was in Grady's thoughts as he gazed to his, his, uh, his two co-workers. His face was smashed to the point where expression was uh, unrecognisable. Uh, was Grady hoping they'd save him, or was he wishing for them to leave him there to die? They make the decision. They want to help them with any chance they could, but it might not be the best choice. There would be the possibility of him bleeding out, and they wouldn't want their family or them to be a, put at risk for the discovery of the body and allowing him to stay. Uh, the moral here is that this is the unfortunate reality in situations like this. People can be saved, but evil corporations, money, can prevent that from happening. Capitalism! <laughs> they make that decision and will wait for him to pass when the morning comes. They would seal off the attraction. We get one last glimpse at Grady's perspective. Goodbye, Grady. Ronan sniffled as they walk out. Oh my gosh! They just leave him to die? Wow! Grady had watched his two co-workers leave as they went behind the yellow wall. Despite being immobile, his ears, they were the only body parts that had avoided the massive trauma. The tube and the transparent wall muted sound. He had, however, heard some of what they said. He heard enough. Grady had wanted to cry even more he had already. When Tate had hypothesized, he was paralyzed, if only. Yes, Grady's spine was broken, but somehow his nerve endings were functioning. He had become a pile of indescribable human suffering. Grady couldn't uh, hate his co-workers for leaving him to die. He would have done the same thing. He needed his job as much as they did. But Laura, who had been secretly pulling on Grady the whole time Roman and Tate had been standing there talking, spoke up. You're stuck. I will help you. With one snap and pull. It was an agonizing last moment, but she was putting him out of his misery. Uh, any other time, he would have pushed a, a Laura away. Not this time. Wow. Yeah, that's a great line. That is so good. <laughs> that is so good. Um, if Grady had to die trapped in his worst nightmare, he didn't want to do it alone. Even Ballora's cold and unfeeling grip was better than nothing. Ballora spoke one last time. You're stuck. I will help you. <laughs> Great writing. Great writing. How do these stories keep getting so good? If you didn't catch on, the checkpoints were a reminder of the linen closet for a reason. This was metaphorical for where his fear stemmed from. Yes, he was alone during that moment, but he wasn't now. Ballora was there with him. I love... That story. It's so good. <laughs> I don't know how else I can iterate this. How? How do these stories get so good? Um, I love the fear factor that we just said. How it, he's reminded of his past trauma. I love Ballora in this. And I love the kind of twist ending. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a twist ending. But I mean it kind of is. It's really good writing how Ballora is there uh, and he, like he finally wishes Ballora is there or like he's, he's finally grateful that Ballora is there rather than wishing she wasn't there um, or whatever. But yeah, that is really good. Um, let's not skim past the first part though. That is insane that we saw the pizza plex again in that uh, and we got the map. We got the map. We also got a timeline placement somewhat. I mean, nothing really happened uh, at that time, but we know that this has to happen five months earlier than the opening. So it has to be in uh, December or January of a year. Listen, this story is incredible. Tell me what you think in the comments below. Seriously, amazing, amazing work. We're going to be doing the epilogue as well. And the epilogue is apparently where it pops off. So I'll see you then. Goodbye.